not a retinol alternative. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's one of the ones I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Like, we just spent a long time going through the available research data for you. you. All of you can dial back to our retinol episodes and understand our pain when we hear stuff like retinol alternative. Like, why? <laughs> Okay, we are back, everybody. Welcome back to the Chemist Confessions podcast. I'm Victoria. I'm Gloria, and this is Kumo the cat. <laughs> Kumo's back again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and this is a human conversation plus one cat on all the skincare science we talk about on the daily. And today we are talking about an antioxidant that is not vitamin C. <laughs> yes, we are finally venturing out away from the comfort of all the clinical research and diving into something a little less understood. But mm-hmm. I will say, as far as the antioxidant realm goes, it's not the worst offender in terms of amount data. Yep. So today we are talking about resveratrol. And you might have heard about it. And I'll be honest, the landscape is actually not that large. There's not that many products out there, but generally people know that grape stuff does something. And I think it's partially because of this molecule. Yeah, for sure. And I do think like products that that um, features with virtual the molecules as starting ingredient, mm-hmm. um, I feel like they kind of hit a stride maybe four or five years ago. There were a couple mm-hmm. more launches with that. Mm-hmm. And since then, people, it's almost like the industry kind of took a step back, be like, okay, you guys like this? <laughs> is this good for anyone? Like, should we keep making products with resveratrol? What does the data say? So, yeah, Victor is absolutely right. The landscape isn't as as rich as it could be, or like, I guess it's kind of like, but uh, but I guess to compare it with something like a green tea, I feel mm. like resveratrol is like that grape stuff realm. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit more meat there, and versus like a green tea where everyone knows that it's an antioxidant. It's in so many things, but. Yeah. What does that really do? Nah, we don't really know. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to get right into it. We're going to ask the very simple question. What is resveratrol? Um, so just as a review in a nutshell, resveratrol is an antioxidant. It is a polyphenol. You'll hear this a lot with a lot of plant antioxidants. Green tea is another one of those. Just know that polyphenols are just a class of um, compounds that contain things like flavonoids um, and Honestly, polyphenol is super diverse. It's a huge library of molecules. The only thing that qualifies it as a polyphenol is that it has a phenol group. We'll put the structure up on the screen here for you guys. But yeah, it could be a lot of things. So that hopefully gives you an idea of why it's an antioxidant in terms of its structure. And then the other thing to note about resveratrol is that it's not just in grape stuff. Um, It's also associated with things like blueberries. Um, It's found in some root like uh, traditional Chinese medicine types of roots as well. So it's not only tied to grape stuff, but that's kind of the main uh, marketing story, I think, that we'll often hear. Yeah, for sure. And resveratrol kind of first caught the eye now as a skincare ingredient, but really as like an oral supplement. Yeah. Because it's tied to, you know, known quote unquote antioxidant powerhouses like grapes, um, blueberries and raspberries. Mm -hmm. Um, People thought, you know, why don't we isolate this molecule and put it in supplements? So some of the earliest research was kind of in that realm. And there are a lot of, I well, actually, I shouldn't say a lot of, there are some papers out there that, um, that study was virtual in that capacity. And I really love this line uh, from this review paper I'm going to just drop in here. Uh, this one is looking at oral resveratrol as even a potential, a powerful enough antioxidant to potentially target things like cancer prevention. Mm. And they had this beautiful line here that says, Nonetheless, resveratrol application is still being a major challenge for pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, I think that pretty much sets the tone. And bioavailability, <laughs> as well as adverse uh, effects. Yeah, and what we'll mm-hmm. say, I think for people who have been listening to us for some time, it's not a problem that's unique to resveratrol. It's, very, it's a common thing for the antioxidant realm. And mm-hmm. maybe this, uh, well, this is part of the reason why you won't see as many resveratrol products out there. Uh, in, in my past life, when I there was one product where I had to work with resveratrol, it was definitely many hours watching the powder, just like swimming around in the beaker a little bit, yeah. wanting to, but kind of now wanting to dissolve. So yeah, definitely a challenging molecule. Yeah, we're definitely going to get into all those quirks uh, when we talk about how to shop for skincare. Um, but let's let's get into it. Let's just go ahead and get into the data. How 
does resveratrol compare to like an antioxidant powerhouse like vitamin C? I think that was the main question we kept getting um, when we polled our followers. So is there even any data to justify? Gloria went down the rabbit hole. So let's see. Resveratrol is an oral supplement where we're not going to get into here. Mm -hmm. Topically, a lot of the resveratrol data is in that in vitro cell culture phase. And mm -hmm. the main thing that they're looking at is actually resveratrol is an ingredient that can target tyrosinase and other pathway that's associated with pigment production. Yes. So it's actually most mm -hmm. of the data stems from uh, resveratrol as a brightening uh, hyperpigmentation ingredient. Mm -hmm. I'll put kind of the table up here. They've actually been through the gamut of tests uh, in terms of in vitro hyperpigmentation data. Mm -hmm. And it shows that it's pretty promising. And they even went down to the animal model side where they tested on, um, on rodent models to reduce UV-induced skin pigmentation with one percent resveratrol topically. So that's kind of the early forays of what resveratrol can potentially do for your skin topically. There's also a couple of smaller studies with 22 subjects, 21 subjects um, using about 0.4 percent resveratrol to mm -hmm. look at, again, hyperpigmentation with some level of success. And that's kind of it in terms of what resveratrol is, what it can do for you topically. But of course, the number one question we get is, okay, that's cool and all, but how does it compare to vitamin C? Yeah, I have a couple thoughts here. I think the first one, I really like um, this diagram that Gloria found that kind of shows like the mechanism of resveratrol. But I don't know if Gloria feel this way, is like after they do kind of their in vitro screen in cell culture, I feel like a lot of these ingredients just get tied to like a bunch of mechanisms. Like I almost find this diagram kind of funny where it's like resveratrol helps here and here and here and here in the pathway. <laughs> and like, you're just like, that's, yeah, I, I, I mean, sure, maybe it's flagged for that, but like, can we actually say that's a true mechanism? Does it really um, play its part in four different ways? Like I, I always feel slightly skeptical of that, but Anyways, I, that's just one of the things I always, every time we do mechanism research, I feel this way. I'm like, I'm not really sure. You know, the funny thing, it's funny you said that because I looked at that chart and I kept scrolling really fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's almost like when you see more than four arrows, it's yeah. like, they don't know. They, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, just, this is just a guess here. It's like pin the tail on the donkey kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think the other thing I did want to mention is um, people might be wondering why we started talking about uh, resveratrol as a hyperpigmentation ingredient, even though we introduced it as an antioxidant. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that this actually happens a lot in skincare in terms of tying antioxidants to actual skin benefits because they it's kind of almost like an adjacent skin benefit would be that it can help with hyperpigmentation because as an antioxidant it's reducing the free radicals that are causing hyperpigmentation so mm -hmm. hopefully that links everything together for you guys in terms of why it's almost like this jump that's happening in terms of testing and what it's actually being tied to but yeah and with that yeah that's kind of the question that everybody has is yeah how does it compare to vitamin c which is not the easiest question to answer for sure. So before we address that question, we're <laughs> definitely going to need a break. <laughs> yes, a break. So while being on the subject of hyperpigmentation, our gold standard AHA booster is loaded with 30% glycolic acid and 5% tranexamic acid to serve as your tactical exfoliating and hyperpigmentation tool. These percentages sound like a lot, but it's for a good reason. You can use this booster in two ways. Add a drop and mix well to your serum or moisturizer for a nightly treatment, or just use the gold standard as a once a week, 10 minute wash off mask for a more simplified and level up experience. Make our chemist creations do more for your skin. Podcast listeners, please use CC Podcast 2024 for 15% off your first order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're back. All right. Time to get into it, Gloria. Resveratrol versus vitamin C ascorbic acid. If we must. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got here? <laughs> All right, guys. All right, guys. You, everyone's going to have to bear with us here, okay? Yeah. Because there is no easy way for us to answer this question. Um, as much as we love to do what we did for a retinal episode and go, well, guys, here's an interesting clinical that look at the two together. And here is our chemist take on the data and what we can take away from it. Yeah, no, it's not going to happen here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what we wound up having to do is we wound up having to look at in vitro data and extrapolate takeaways from said in vitro data, which is not what we love to do. Not ideal. Not no, ideal. Not at all. But that's such as 
the cards were dealt because there are no, there's nothing out there that basically compare the two in a head-to-head manner.、Mm-hmm. So it be what it be. <laughs> All right, let's jump. Let's jump into it. <sighs> study in numero uno. This is an in vitro study on cow DNA versus hydrogen peroxide as the offender. So they tested it against a bunch of different known antioxidants,、mm-hmm. including alpha lipoic acid, which, by、mm-hmm. the way, is also one that. Kind of hopped on hype train, and then it derailed, fell into a ditch in Siberia, and no one knows about it anymore. But、um, that's so true. I don't know what happened. It was so buzzy for、yes. like three months, and then、yeah. just like,、Phew. yep, yep. <laughs> um. Anyway, but the main reason why we pulled out the study is it also features vitamin C, the ascorbic acid form of it, and、yep. resveratrol. Yeah. In the study, something that they highlighted was the IC50 value. So, long、mm-hmm. story short, the smaller the value, the more efficient the molecule is.、Mm-hmm. So, in this kind of assay, if you don't need as much of the molecule to basically defend the cow DNA from hydrogen peroxide, then they the idea is that oh, then you need less of it to help say your skin.、Uh, and you can see from this chart that resveratrol did. Better than vitamin C in terms of efficiency,、mm-hmm. uh, but other than that, this is basically it from this paper in terms of how the two compares.、Mm-hmm. Even though it's more efficient, I wouldn't say it's like astoundingly more efficient. Yeah, and and something that I really want the main takeaway from this is a lot of times this is how antioxidant research starts, and this、mm. is a tiny piece of the puzzle because first of all, cow DNA very specific situation,、mm-hmm. hydrogen peroxide another very specific situation. The reality is, when it comes to antioxidants, and you hear about things like attacks of the free radical,、mm. there are a lot of different types of free radical、um, that your skin is exposed to on the daily. So again, this doesn't mean that the takeaway is that oh, okay, resveratrol is X percent more effective or efficient than vitamin C. It just means in this assay, <laughs> in this very specific scenario, it performed on par to a little better. That's such a good point. Also. Lipoic acid. I think that just mildly, interestingly high volume sounds not so inefficient here. Yeah, and and again, like this episode of resveratrol. But if you look at lipoic acid, that when it was on the hype train for that hot second there, yeah, it was often it's that ingredient often touted as X number times more like whatever、yes. than vitamin C. That's based on a very different type of study. That's、yes. based on. Uh, I think it was there was an in vitro study and one like actual clinical testing where they kind of validated, where they make that statement、mm-hmm. from. So you can just tell that this particular study is one lens, one way of looking at this whole thing. Yes.、Yeah. yeah. Yeah. Totally. So speaking of one lens, there's another study that Gloria found that's also looking at a different scenario. We're looking at rat mitochondria this time.、Mm-hmm. There. It's a comparative, which is nice.、Um, they're looking at lipoic acid again, ascorbic acid, and resveratrol. And if you're wondering why mitochondria gets looked at, it's actually one of the big concerns with free radicals. Free radicals—they're these things that are looking to couple up, you know. And so one of the things is, in order to couple up, it disrupts other aspects like your DNA. And they're looking at、um, how it's trying to couple up and really mess up your mitochondria, mitochondria which plays a very important function. Not just for skin health, but for your body as well. So that's also why it's being looked at here, which is interesting. We won't get into the details too much. Remember, this is another in vitro study, but basically, same thing. They're looking at different aspects of how to quench reactive oxygen species, and there's different types of free radicals they're looking at. So here, they're looking at essentially,、um, I would say, probably three different actions where. They're looking at、uh, manganese superoxide dismutase activity. If it increases, this is a good thing. That means that it's generating, I guess,、um, antioxidant、um, capabilities in your skin.、Mm-hmm. They're also looking at how it decreases in reactive oxygen species in general.、Um, and then another aspect they're looking at is this glutathione peroxidase activity. All of these three aspects are essentially、um, antioxidant free radical fighting behavior. So they did a comparison. And I'm not going to get into it too much. I'm just going to summarize that resveratrol induced significant increase in manganese superoxide dismutase activity, as well as decreasing in reactive oxygen species. But what's more interesting is that in comparison to ascorbic acid and lipoic acid, they all behave differently. So、mm-hmm. um, resveratrol was the only one that decreased in reactive oxygen species, while as lipoic acid had 
glutathione peroxidase activity. Uh, vitamin C also had different aspects. So this is really just to tell you that, or I guess really just to showcase that a lot of these antioxidant actives are providing benefits in different ways, which is, I think, almost like level level five, level 10 antioxidant knowledge and knowing that there's different aspects to target to kind of get your broad spectrum antioxidant aspect. Hopefully that makes sense. Gloria, fill in the gaps. I don't know if I did, <laughs> I, I explained that well, but yeah. So this is why I think antioxidant is a topic I love and that I love to hate on because you yeah. can get very nerdy with it. Yes. it. It can get so interesting and so complex. Yes. When you use a topical antioxidant like vitamin C, right? There's thoughts of, oh, okay, vitamin C itself is an antioxidant. So it directly quenches the free radicals that may be generated by cell function, by UV mm -hmm. light and whatnot. But then there's also ingredients that are looked at from these different angles of, mm -hmm. okay, this thing when you when you apply topically or when you introduce more of it to your skin, it boosts skin's own antioxidant defense system, like mm -hmm. the superoxides and whatnot. And that's something that I think can be hard to communicate topically because mm -hmm. first of all, let's not get into the legality of whether or not you can make those claims. But secondly, <laughs> I think people do forget that your skin comes with its own antioxidant mm. system already. And ironically, I think that's why, uh, why a lot of the good science behind antioxidant gets a little lost in translation. Yes. So to agree with Victoria, it's very, it's very complex. It's hard to get into the weeds without spending three, four, five hours a whole book on the mechanism of different mechanisms of antioxidants. Yes. But the main takeaway here is ascorbic acid, lipoic acid, resveratrol are all helpful, but all in different ways, biologically speaking. We totally hope that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. And I, I'm so glad you brought it up. This is our pain when it comes to rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. Is Gore and I, I think after dabbling in research for so long, we get a little existential with how research is done. And mm -hmm. I think antioxidants is a good example of like, it depends on what angle you're coming at. Just as Gloria was saying, it's like, if you're looking at this ingredient to specifically tackle a, a reactive oxygen species versus are you looking at this ingredient to help your skin? These are all different perspectives and different right. testing to make the whole story. And sometimes Gloria and I, our job is to like, essentially put the puzzle pieces together to understand what is it actually useful or is it looked at at such a narrow scope that it's actually not all that relevant but anyways i i got off tangent but the point is it's very painful research <laughs> yeah and, and i just want to shout out to people who love listening to this stuff with us this is why we do it because i i get it i think a lot of people really just want does it work or not? And what product <laughs> should I buy? And I totally understand, but I, I do think this is a fascinating topic and this is the type of background work that that can go into one, you know, signature anti uh, one signature product that may be relevant for decades to come. Yeah. That I guess like sometimes it's like, oh, it's a shame that it doesn't get enough spotlight, but other times it's because it's so complex, it's also easy to hide the foo foo not so great mm -hmm. stuff in the weeds. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anyway, that gets a little philosophical. Mm -hmm. But we have looked at now rat cells, cow cells, and we are graduating to the next level of in vitro data, which is human cells and Ooh. not just any human cells, human keratinocytes, so actual Excellent. skin cells. Excellent. Yes. So in this in vitro study, they looked at human keratinocytes versus pollution. This study is very complex. Again, we're going to pull out just a couple of pieces from this because what they did is they actually did a crap ton of different in vitro assays on these human cells. Mm. They include DPPH, which is a very standard antioxidant test. There's lipid peroxidation, another type of antioxidant test to look at different species of free radicals and also wound healing. But we are going to zoom. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I it's it's a lot. I squinted a lot and took me like a good two hours to read from the paper. <laughs> and I only pulled out the pollution data because I'm ah, like, cool. this might be the most interesting. Mm -hmm. If we spend all we can spend all podcasts talking about this one paper without a bunch of takeaways. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this one, they actually looked at ascorbic acid, resveratrol, and the two in combination when the cells are exposed to all these different conditions. Mm -hmm. So I will share one of the charts with you guys here. Feel free to pause if you're on YouTube so you can take a look at the chart yourself. It is pretty complex. Um, they put these cells through a lot of different conditions. There's darkness, there's different light exposures, mm -hmm. there's different simulations for different seasons. But 
long story short, the takeaway is that so first of all, we should talk about what the bars mean. I love that these charts, they don't give you a legend of what each bar <laughs> is convenient in the side. They have to give it to you in a paragraph. Yeah, they don't even show have the color symbol. You actually have to read for white control cells, black exposed cells. Yep. So white is the cells just chilling. Black is the cells that's exposed to all these stuff, but they don't give them any of the antioxidant. Mm -hmm. uh, the blue are cells exposed to 15 micromolar of ascorbic acid. Mm -hmm. And the red is exposed to 15 micromolar, so same concentration, same amount of resveratrol and vitamin C. Mm -hmm. And the green is the combination of the two of them. Mm. So you can see uh, the point the paper is trying to make is that that combo does a lot more to protect cells than any of the antioxidants mm. by themselves. And you can also that. see from here that I what I find to be a little interesting is if you go shopping, obviously vitamin C, you hear it ranges like 10% vitamin C, 15, mm -hmm. 20% vitamin C. Mm -hmm. um, and resveratrol from the previous cow paper suggests that you don't need as much of resveratrol per se. But then if you look at this chart, resveratrol isn't necessarily more efficient than vitamin C in many, many categories. Mm. <laughs> so Ooh. I will say that's not true for all the assays, but it's just paints the complex picture of, well, it kind of depends on the situation. <laughs> also, Gloria's hinting at the fact that sometimes topical percentages and how they test for feel a little whimsical. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. And I always, and in the case of resveratrol, my suspicion is that it just depends on how much of it they can solubilize. <laughs> That's how 100%, it goes. 100%. Yeah. So I actually really love this paper. I, I think mm -hmm. it showcases that, you know, it's not about whether resveratrol is is better than yeah. vitamin C or not. It just yeah. showcases that it kind of reinforces the rat mitochondria paper that uh, Victoria just went through. Yeah. They both help when you put the two together. They're not competing for the same pathways. Therefore, mm. if you use a two in conjunction, the results is a pretty nice synergistic effect. Yeah, I, I love that takeaway. And I think to sum up, thank God there is one human clinical out there. Yay! Thank God we have something to talk about. So... Mm. Gloria found a clinical, they tested 2% resveratrol on a small conservative subject size of 20 participants. They use this antioxidant once daily for eight weeks. And, you know, the parameters that they're looking for are things like um, improvement in skin barrier function, general skin elasticity, skin density, skin roughness, and skin dispensability, which is kind of like an elasticity adjacent <laughs> kind of. Uh -huh. I know it sounds terrible, but it's essentially an elasticity adjacent kind of uh, measurement. Elasticity and firmness is a whole nother realm of pain. But anyways, just think of it more like along those manners. But yeah, we will sh um, share some of the results. I'll put it up here. Um, they took some imaging so you can see in terms of um, skin evenness and reduction of pigmentation. They also look at skin density and firmness. Uh, this is the, there's one image here where you see kind of this fluorescent green. This is looking at general skin firmness um, before and after eight weeks. And finally, uh, shout out to some of these bar graphs that you used in Word, but holy cow. <laughs> I actually think that's my favorite part about this paper. I laugh so hard because it's like, uh, you used Microsoft's default color. <laughs> <laughs> bro maybe we could change it up just a little bit <laughs> yeah but anyways yeah so i guess to sum up in terms of results here they found that the resveratrol emulsion had they said highly significant in skin surface ph value reduction um, and then stable barrier function parameter was also improved they also saw a highly significant increase in skin moisture during this eight-week application they also saw an improvement in skin firmness, skin ah. roughness. <laughs> Hello, Kubo. He's excited by these results. Kind of, <laughs> sort of. Um, he said, there's a clinical, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we should mention, though, that even though they did see significant improvement, we should talk about some of these numbers, Gloria. Mm, yes. So if you look at some of the charts and whatnot, <laughs> well, I appreciate their use of box and whisker charts. Yes. My favorite one is a skin roughness one. <laughs> yes. Where you're looking at it, you're like, I'm sorry, what's the takeaway here? <laughs> yeah. The numbers are, like, we say significantly improved is always kind of like, oh, great. There is some value there. But if you actually look at the numbers, you might be like, okay. 
for example, skin roughness, an improvement, uh, a decrease in roughness by 6.4%, which we probably would say visibly you might not see that. Or yeah, 6.4, 6. you're going to have to really believe to, <laughs> to see that. Um, but I do really like the redness picture they took. I think mm -hmm. even though this is probably one of the best case scenario, mm -hmm. but it still showed that respiratory... Kumo. <laughs> He's oh, like, no, not the butthole. Oh, no. Avert the eyes. Kumo, please, please. please. No one asked for this. Kumo. <laughs> okay, good boy. <laughs> this is not how you have to say hi to people, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> That's his favorite way, though. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Yeah, I think I remember there was one time, it was a long time ago, Victoria stayed over at our place, not the mic, Kumo. <laughs> he straight up laid on her, which is okay. And then he turned around and then one for the butt in face approach of the like, downward oh, dog hello <laughs> approach <laughs> yeah which felt very intrusive <laughs> yes i so we'd always joke or at least i'd always joke with kumo and say checking on your butthole health today looking mm. good <laughs> yeah Ugh. anyway but yeah this shows the was virtual at two percent does something but in terms of mm. oh my god kumo what's the plan okay yes I forgot what my takeaway was. This, this is it very does something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At um, 2%, there is, I think the takeaway here is generally that, yeah, like Gloria said, it does something. Um, this is sadly one of the very few clinicals out there. So we just love to see more. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I do think because antioxidants are often tied with um, anti-aging properties, mm -hmm. I do think this kind of showcases that maybe this is you know, based on in vitro data, based on other stuff that we've seen, it's not quite what you would expect in terms of like decreasing, decreasing wrinkles and whatnot. Yeah. So from anti-aging perspective, I can like based on this one paper, it's not compared to vitamin C, but it's hard for us to say, oh, think about it in that same anti-aging capacity. Mm. Uh, remember earlier on we mentioned that resveratrol does have more data in terms of pigmentation. Mm. So this is just something to keep your expectation in check. Antioxidant as a category can be very difficult to talk about mm -hmm. because unless it comes with other benefits, like in this paper, it kind of shows that it could do something for retinas and in other papers, it shows that it could brighten hyperpigmentation. Those are great signs to keep going, but by nature, antioxidants are supposed to be preventative skincare. It's supposed to help you with aging in the long term, yep. where Something like this is just, it's just hard to have any takeaway on whether or not it works in that capacity. Totally. And on that note, let's take a break. Oh, come on, Kumo's, it's Yeah, Kumo's like, yes, a break, I'm out. Um, <laughs> yeah, today we're going to fill the break with our animal fun fact of the day. Gloria, take it away. And today's my turn, so you know it's not about the cute and cuddly. Uh, it's uh, about apple snails. They are you know, it has a cute name. It has even more adorable eggs. They look mm -hmm. like little stacks of raspberries mm -hmm. that you can see that's like stuck on the side of stones, rocks, and mm -hmm. whatever they can get their hands on. If you see it, it is not cute. It is one of the most prolific and and robust invasive species you can find. It used uh, to be native to South America. Okay. Um, it is everywhere now. Uh, I remember seeing a lot in... They tend to like more humid climates, so I mm -hmm. see a lot in Asia. I used to mm -hmm. think it's native to Asia. But that's because they love plants like rice and taro, and they <gasps> love to chew holes on top of plants, so they die. <laughs> in Thailand alone, it is estimated that this invasive, spe invasive species cause losses to agriculture of around $3 million a year. Yeah, that's pretty And bad. it's not just crop damage. They eat local snails, plants, and even amphibian eggs. So oh. they take out the competitors and nip them in the bud. What uh, a fatty. Uh -huh, go yeah. Ahead. And one last cherry on top is they can also trans uh they can also trans transfer round worms to humans yay, yay. <laughs> and this little guy is so prolific if you google it if you're in the u.s and you google it the top pages are warning pages mm. from states of florida louisiana and hawaii <laughs> so mm. they're absolutely everywhere if you see them just either crush them or call your wildlife <laughs> preservation uh, group locally because they are a problem Yay, the Yay! apple snail. What an asshole. <laughs> so that's my animal fun fact corner. Yay. Yay. All right. Uh, asshole awareness. That's today. Ah, yes. So you see, Kumo's asshole, we have to raise awareness to other assholes. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Uh, all right. Uh, let's wrap this up with yep. how to shop for resveratrol products. 
Yes. So generally speaking, if you're on the market for it, we would say look for uh, if there's a product with a trans uh, transparent percentage, we will mm -hmm. look for 0.5 to 2%. Mm -hmm. That is the most common percentage we see cited in literature. Mm -hmm. It can work well with vitamin C. Again, the takeaway from the question of is it better than vitamin C is no, but <laughs> it does seem to work very differently. Mm -hmm. So if you are already on vitamin C, you're curious to try this guy out, we wouldn't think about it as a replacement. We would say, mm -hmm. say if you use a vitamin C during the day, respiratory at night, that's a great routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of shopping, we kind of mentioned it before is the landscape is actually quite small. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is because as Gloria hint, subtly hinted at, um, resveratrol is also another unstable ingredient, which means it takes a very talented chemist to actually get it into formula. And because of that, I think, and also the fact that when it dies, it dies about as equal of a sad death as ascorbic acid, if not worse, you may see your resveratrol products um, maybe looking generally tinted yellow in the beginning and then maybe you forget about it and you pump it later and it is a lovely poop brown black color yeah that's your resveratrol um, so with that to simplify we are going to actually walk through three resveratrol products for you and kind of give you just a general idea of what the landscape is and i think we obviously have to start with the most basic beginner uh, affordable product, and that is the Ordinary's Resveratrol 3% plus ferulic acid, uh, 3% as well, serum, ink, thingy. solvent thingy. Gloria, how do we feel about this? Yeah, um, I think this is kind of that beginner product. You mm -hmm. can definitely try out to see if it's right for your skin. Yeah. I will say this, What? why I'm hesitant to recommend something like this is that this has a very simplistic ingredient list. With 3% resveratrol, 3% ferulic acid, that whole junk is dissolved in 94% propane diol. Lovely. What, yeah, which in itself is not a bad ingredient. It's fantastic. We use it in our own lines. It's in both Aquafix and Mr. Reliable. It's a great solvent. But at 94%, it's a little overkill. It's relatively vanilla. I'm not saying that you will absolutely have a reaction to it. Mm -hmm. But if you're experiencing any sort of itchiness, any redness, it's probably from the really high propane diol and just to give you guys an idea in our own product line we use it at about five percent i think at the highest we'll ever go on this is about ten percent just because not everyone's solvent tolerance level is the same so we'll say if you want to try resveratrol and want to go the most economic way and get this product we will kind of use this like a booster just like mix a couple drops into your serum yeah. dilute it down just a little bit yeah so i will say even though because the ingredient list is simple it's a quick way for you to limit test to see if resveratrol is right for you but at the same time it's almost like not the best way to like if you're experiencing irritation then it doesn't tell you whether or not resveratrol is right for you at all oh that's a really good point yeah honestly i have nothing to add to that let's just move on um so in the second tier, we would say this is kind of the mid price point range for resveratrol. So you're looking at about $84. Um, and this is the Caudalie Resveratrol Lift Instant Firming Retinol Alternative Serum. And shout out to, they called it a retinol alternative. We hate this claim. Let's look at this more for what it is, which is resveratrol as an antioxidant not a retinol alternative. <laughs> yeah, actually it's one of the ones I'm like, I'm sorry, what, like we just spent a long time going through the available resveratrol data for you. you all of you can dial back to our retinal episodes and understand our pain when we hear stuff like retinal alternative like why <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so um in terms of this ingredient list it is a emulsion so mm -hmm. um it doesn't just include resveratrol which i don't believe they disclose the actual percentage no. but it does have other ingredients like a couple hyaluronic acids of different uh, sizes they have a couple peptides as well mm -hmm. um so you know this is definitely one of those like a little bit more resveratrol plus kind of uh, formulas and i do want to mention here the reason why we classify it as mid-tier is they actually they did a clinical consumer perception study where they have 42 volunteers that tested it for 56 days or eight weeks two months I, I never understand what causes them to do 56 days versus eight weeks i don't understand but anyway, so they say one of the claims they have is 98% soft, firmer, more lifted skin, but they do have a before and after, which is, I think I see the improvement, Gloria. I think I do. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, what they do is they did take clinical images and mm -hmm. the second image, it looked like lines in general are reduced. 
Uh, I will say the lighting looks slightly different to me, even mm-hmm. though the setting seems more professional. It just, you know, I think that shine from the initial picture versus the second picture yeah. to me is a little bit odd. But mm-hmm. either way, I, at least it's a two month clinical mm-hmm. twice a day. So that's why I think it's still a pretty decent product for the mid tier. But you can see there's already a big jump in price point. I did want to call out, Gloria, their claim that we always talk about and just mentioned here. They have a claim that says 3x more effective than retinol to firm and lift. And in terms of the asterisk fine details, they say action on skin appearance in vitro test on uh, ingredients association. I don't know how you make can make firm and lift claim based on in vitro test, but... Yeah. Uh, We'd be a little skeptical here. Exactly. So this is a classic example of those like numeral X claims that happens and how it's tied to oftentimes in vitro data. So it's a good example of this and how Gore and I don't really care too much about this one. But anyways, and finally, we have to talk about our highest tier. Skin goes with Veritrol BE, the granddaddy of it all, clocks in at $168. So every Ooh. tier is like a 70 bucks jump. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we will say this is kind of the, I guess this is the standard, right? First of all, there's transparent percentages. There's 1% resveratrol, 0.5% biclin, which is another antioxidant that have roots in traditional medicine, mm. and 1% vitamin E in the form of alpha tocopherol. Mm. And they not only did a study, the study was published in a journal online, and to say. it's kind of intense. So first of all, it's 12 weeks, so much, much longer. They did a lot of stuff. So on top of um, clinical assessment of skin condition, they even took images. These are ultrasound images of the crow's feet area. Mm-hmm. And what we're looking at is the more green the image is, the more dense skin is. Mm-hmm. And it shows that uh, from the imaging that there's like an 18.9% increasing skin density mm-hmm. and that may translate to perception of firmer skin and also more dense skin might decrease the appearance of wrinkles as well mm-hmm. and this also translates into a chart that i don't think i can put up on screen because it says do not copy penalties apply <laughs> <laughs> but to sum up they did uh they use instrumental measurements to qual uh to Kind of look at the quality of skin across a lot of different metrics mm-hmm. like fine lines wrinkles firmness elasticity da, 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 even skin tone hyperpigmentation overall appearance tactile yes. roughness radiance Oof. all these measured at week four week eight and week 12 compared mm-hmm. to the baseline mm-hmm. and in terms of the um percent improvement from baseline the most significant are fine lines clocking at it's about a 17 percent improvement mm-hmm. tactile roughness comes in at uh, over 18 percent improvement by the end of the study at week 12 mm-hmm firmness elasticity are all up those are kind of in the order of 10 percent improvement so kind of that trending in the right direction but perception yeah. may or may not be that great yeah. skin tone to me was interesting because some of the earlier studies kind of indicate that yes. resveratrol may be great for hyperpigmentation uh but that only comes in eight percent improvement which when it comes to skin tone it's not something that would be super perceptible it might be a little brighter yes. and i think this is actually such an important thing to highlight because Again, we talk about, we kind of go on rants about hyperpigmentation being a really complex problem. Yeah. Antioxidants are often linked to it because it can prevent, you know, UV damage induced pigmentation. Mm -hmm. That's one part of it. Mm Kind of like glycolic acid and other exfoliants are also linked to it, but it's also one part of the equation. So you kind of need a combination therapy there to see significant improvement. Yeah. (laughs) I was going to just add to that on top of that. They also looked at hyperpigmentation with clocks in with just above 6% improvement right. by week 12. So yeah, that's exactly, it's such a good point that even though, you know, we initially focused on hyperpigmentation by the end of it, I guess I can see how they wanted to compete with retinol, but overall, they're really looking at a more, a lot of different aspects of anti-aging by the end of it, not really just hyperpigmentation. Yeah, Exactly. So that's it. That kind of sums up the virtual landscape. Hope Yay. this helps you guys Was understand why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully that addresses why it's hard to talk about. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as the best antioxidant, even yeah. though we understand that's why a lot of people, that's naturally what you want to know is yeah. because you hear claims like X percent better than vitamin C or X percent more potent. And you yeah. wonder if there is such thing as the best antioxidant. This is the data. Um, there's no, the resveratrol, I think, as far as antioxidant go, is an interesting one to try. But yeah, that's kind of where we are. I think that the was other such thing, a loophole conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I think 
resveratrol, we will say, is oftentimes the antioxidant that we will suggest for people who can't handle vitamin C's in general. And we're not just talking about ascorbic acid, we're also talking about some of the derivatives as well. Sometimes we have a few people who are like, I just can't deal with the vitamin C category. Is there anything else? And we will say this is kind of that next antioxidant up, even though the data is not as robust. Sadly, in the antioxidant space, this is probably one of the second place antioxidants ingredients out there compared to some of the other ones, which is barely anything, really. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on that note, that is it for this episode. Woohoo! <laughs> um, so if you have any other burning questions, you can write to us at info at chemistconfessions.com. Um, all of our uh, general research, we highly suggest you check out our website and our blog at chemistconfessions.com. You can also DM us your questions at chemist.confessions on Instagram. Please also check out our stories where we poll you guys for your questions that shape each of these episodes. And finally, you can also check out um, our content on TikTok as well, although please do not DM us there. Otherwise, we hope uh, you enjoyed this episode and we will see you next time. Bye guys! Bye guys.